So that's it. I think we should start. We are already a, a little bit late. So my first duty is to introduce the first speaker, who is uh, uh, Agi Kovac. I met her first 15 years ago at a meeting at, uh, next to Lake Balaton that Chaba Play organized there. That was a meeting, common meeting between Hungarian community psychologists and Jacques Mailer's group in Trieste. Uh, Lila Gleitman was also there. Uh, Agi was there not as a Hungarian cognitive scientist, but as a student from Jacques Miller's lab. At that time, she worked on, I think, rule learning in infancy, but later she became more famous about other two topics, bilingualism and uh, theory of mind, uh, both of which uh, produced a science paper during her, actually, uh, during her uh, uh, doctoral uh, studies. And then, uh, uh, after graduating, she, she joined Dury's lab here in Budapest, and as soon as the, we established the center, uh, she became a postdoc here. Then she actually got an, an ERC grant, started to build her, her own group, become a PI in the lab, and be later a faculty member in the community uh, science department. Uh, and uh, recently, he, she, she started to get even more various kinds of roles in the uh, both outside CU and in the CU, probably the most important is that last August she took over the directorship of the CDC from me, so relieving me from some administrative duties. So without further ado, uh, please welcome the first speaker of the conference, the present director of the CDC, Agi. Thank you very much. I'll try to switch on the microphone. Um, okay, just one more second. So thank you very much, Gerge, for the very nice introduction. Can you all hear me? <coughs> yes, okay. So, um, and thank you for coming um, to this uh, wonderful workshop, and of course, thank you for Gerge for organizing this wonderful event, and we are very much looking forward to the event. I will talk today about um, a topic which uh, I'm interested in since more than uh, 10 years, and this is how young infants make inferences about um, other minds, and I will present some studies which uh, are uh, older, we started many years ago, some newer studies. However, these are all important to show how our reasoning about specific questions has evolved um, during this uh, 10 years uh, uh, period. So, um, the one of the most interesting um, questions in cognitive development, for me at least, is how young infants arrive to reason or to understand that actually human behavior is not only guided by the reality, but also by what one entity or one human being believes about the reality, about uh, his or her internal mental states, about her goals, beliefs, and intentions, and how, one, how a young child realizes that actually um, this is what can most or best predict the behavior. For instance, if someone believes that this workshop is taking place in a different building, then her behavior can be predicted based on this belief and not based on the reality that we have started the workshop here because she or he will go to a different building. So um, when we talk about reasoning about other minds, we usually refer to the theory of mind ability or the ability to realize that behavior is guided by these internal mental states, but which are not directly observable. And of course, for developmental, it's an interesting um, question which we ask, how young children arrive to do this, how young children arrive to go beyond the here and now, go beyond the reality, and actually realize that there are some um, um, some internal states which guide behavior. There are some that some people can have another perspective which can be different from the reality and how these processes uh, are supported, what kind of mechanisms uh, support these processes, what are the triggering cues for such, such processes and what kind of um, representation might be involved. So I will try to um, address some of these questions, but before going there, what I would like to do is actually just um, 
very briefly, Iru say that this perspective taking or reasoning about other minds seems to be very prevalent in our everyday life. For instance, if we consider adults, just consider a very simple situation of having a coffee with your best friend. And if you realize at a certain moment that your friend points to the salt container asking for the sugar, you will no, have no problem in actually inferring that she probably meant the, the sugar and not the salt. And she will actually disconsider her pointing behavior and you will modify your behavior according to her intention. You will immediately realize that she wants the sugar and you will give her the sugar. And uh, such examples are not only very frequent in, uh, in human-adult interactions, but also in our interactions with, uh, with young infants. For instance, if we take a different, different domain, if we take um, um, the domain of uh, linguistic communication, so here as well, there are very, different, um, very many different perspectives one can take. For instance, consider a very um, uh, a s a small example of uh, of a young child who, um, and, um, and the mother and the child talking. So this is, let's say, a 12-month-old uh, child. And the mother says to the child, oh, nice dog. The child answers, waf, waf. Don't pull the dogs here, says the mother. And the child answers, no, waf, waf. Why I'm saying that these are different perspectives? Because these two interlocutors take two different linguistic perspectives on the very same entity, the dog. One calls it a dog, and one calls it waf, waf. However, they have no problem whatsoever in realizing that although they use different linguistic perspectives to refer to it, they mean the same entity and the communication is very smooth and the interaction is very smooth. However, of course, at this point you might think, yes, maybe there are many examples where we do this perspective taking with different perspectives or with conflicting perspectives very easily. However, there are also many other examples when we fail in perspective taking, when we actually fail to take into account that someone else knows something different, thinks differently, has different um, convictions, or just uh, um, um, uh, is a, has a different view on the world. So just as an illustration, uh, for instance, uh, many people, or if you take a couple, often in a couple, uh, the two people in the couple might have different perspectives of how important anniversaries are. For some people, anniversaries are really prevalent and really uh, wash out everything. For other people, anniversaries are important, but not the most important in, in the thing in the world. And from this, uh, different, of course, this might have many reasons. It might come from family traditions, how much weight um, one puts on, uh, on anniversaries. However, of course, might lead to conflicts. Although, of course, in this couple, each of the, of the, of the people in the couple knows what perspective the other has on the uh, on, on these, uh, these anniversaries, and they know that there are these different perspectives. However, still conflicts can arise when one forgets the anniversary, for instance. And of course, um, just to go back to the other domain, the domain of linguistic communication and to infants and children, um, of course, there is also another um, uh, example which one can think of. So there is a period in, um, in, uh, in development, around 18 months, when children fail to take into account the perspectival nature of, index of indexicals. For instance, uh, they use uh, wrongly referring the pronouns I or you. So just consider this, um, uh, this example when the mother says, you eat your broccoli now, and the child answers, not you, mommy eats broccoli. And of course, he, the child uses you to refer to, to, to himself. So sometimes we really um, take perspective very easily. Sometimes we fail to take perspectives. And um, my question is, and what I want to address here, is not when we fail, why do we fail, but when we succeed, why we succeed, and what are the underlying mechanisms, and what kind of processes um, are, um, support this uh, kind of computations. So. Um, I would like to start with a well-known example of uh, which, um, o o with a well-known task, which was used as a litmus test for theory of mind reasoning in development, which is the so-called false belief task. So how can we know whether um, a child or an entity reasons about false beliefs or the beliefs of another? We can know if we take situations in which the reality and the beliefs of someone are conflicting. Um, and this is the, what the false belief tasks rely on, which was developed by Joseph Perner and collaborators in 83. So I will just briefly go over the task. I'm sure all of you know it, but um, later on I will make some points and uh, um, it might be interesting to, uh, for that reason. 
So in this task, there is a character who has a chocolate and uh, he hides this chocolate in, the, in one of these two cupboards. Then he goes out to play and then the mother comes in and uh, cleans the cupboard and replaces the chocolate from where it was to another cupboard. And then the child comes back and of course, the question which, uh, for instance, three and four year olds are asked, where will this child look for his chocolate? And of course, if you have a full theory of mind or if a child has a theory of mind abilities, then this child should reason that he will look for his chocolate where he believes the chocolate to be and not where the chocolate actually is because he was not there when the location change has happened. He's not aware of this change and his behavior will be guided by the internal state and not by the reality. However, this is not what we find uh, um, in the developmental literature. If we um, uh, administer this task in a way, um, in a verbal way, then what is found that children younger than uh, four years old usually fail. So let's say usually 50% of the children pass only this task at the age of four and um, more children or most of the children succeed only after the age of four. However, of course, there can be many reasons why they fail besides uh, not having a theory of mind. There were several claims in the literature that there might be some reality bias, that the fact that we know or the child knows where the <coughs> chocolate is drives away his uh, responses and that uh, he has to inhibit reality in order to take into account uh, others' beliefs. But however, as I said, I will concentrate mostly on successes, but I want to mention one more thing about failures. So <coughs> seemingly, not only children around four fail, like 50% of them, but also we adults fail in some of this theory of mind task. And there are several studies which suggest that this failure is not 5% or 1% or 10%. These failures can go up to 30% on average. So these are two tasks. So one is um, the uh, study by Birch and Bloom from 2007. So this is a standard kind of uh, theory of mind task, but with more locations. And what it is found that actually we adults also make mistakes in this, uh, in this task. So it's not only children, but we make mistakes as well. And this is another task. This is the director task where um, you, have to, you have two interlocutors. This is um, uh, a reference. You have to identify what the other person <laughs> refers to. And you have a shelf. I'm, not, I'm sure you all know this task, but um, let me just briefly describe it. So you have, for instance, two cups, but only one of the cups, uh, you see two cups, but your interlocutor sees only one of the cups. And he said, when he says, give me the cup, sometimes in 30% of the cases, you hesitate between the two cups, although she cannot see the second cup. So it's clear that she, he or she must refer to the, to the cup uh, which you see. So why I'm saying you that adults also make mistakes? Because sometimes when we, when we study young infants or when we study children, the 70% good performance or 30% bad performance does not go uh, be, beyond chance. It will be not significantly different from chance if you use only one trial and let's say 20 children. If you use us several trials or bigger populations, of course, the 70% will be significantly different from chance. But um, I, what I want to point out that it's not only that children and infants might have difficulties with some theory of mind situation, but as also adults. So, however, as I said, I'm most interested in successes. So if we succeed, in case we assume that we succeed as adults and infants, so if, when we succeed, how can we explain that and what kind of processes are involved? And what I would like to mention that there are, in the last 15 years, there have been many, many studies involving different kind of procedures um, which have uh, shown that actually already young infants seem to pass this kind of theory of mind task when you use implicit measurements. So how we transform an, um, a task like this uh, the, um, with the, the chocolate task into a, into a task which uses implicit measurements, you simply show the same scenario that there is an agent, there is a replacement, and then the agent comes back. And what you either, uh, you measure implicit, um, uh, implicit uh, behavioral markers, for instance, you measure where this baby or where this um, um, uh, will look for, uh, so what, what, this what kind of prediction will make this baby about the behavior of the agent. So for instance, this, this uh, agent has a false belief, then he comes back and you measure whether the baby predicts that this agent will, will reach to the correct location or to the empty location, which is however congruent with uh, her beliefs. And what is found is in this task is actually that um, 
uh, in many different tasks which use different kind of measurement that seemingly in many of these tasks infants seem to perform very well and based on this it was argued that seemingly disabilities are present very, very early on. In the last years there have been also lots of um, effort invested in replication studies and some of these studies uh, do not replicate and um, it's always a debate why uh, uh, some studies replicate, why some studies don't replicate. And nowadays there's a huge effort in invested in multi-lab replication, which I think they are really important to, uh, to find out which are the reliable tasks which we can use for diagnostic purposes. However, I would like to add one thing, which is even if we find out which is the more reliable task, that, and we find out that some tasks are more reliable, some other tasks are less reliable, what I would like to mention that we find out about the task itself and not ab about the underlying mechanism. Thus, um, also a very important research avenue should be to find out if there is success or if we assume that uh, there, there are such abilities in infancy, then we should find out what, uh, what are the processes that are involved, how, how do we explain them, what are the mechanisms uh, which, um, which support them and what kind of representations are involved. And this is the avenue which I will focus um, on this talk mostly. So, but before going to experimental studies, what I would like to mention that uh, um, although um, there's a lot of debate and lots of questioning whether do infants have theory of mind, do they not have theory of mind, do they solve this task uh, at all, do they use some, slow, some lower level mechanism, do they um, uh, involve some kind of associative uh, uh, learning that they associate the object with the agent and the location, they do not reason, reason about the beliefs. However, um, 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 rather convincing evidence that they do uh, recruit beliefs or, the, or more, let's say they do recruit the same kind of processes what we adults recruit, and usually it's not debated that we adults uh, are recruiting theory of mind processes and we adults do reason about other minds. And um, uh, the, the, the piece of evidence which I wanted to mention here is a neuroimaging evidence where it was shown that the very same region which are recruited by adults in this kind of theory of mind task, so in the false belief condition of, um, of this task, so this is exactly the same scenario with the, with the change of location and the false belief of the, of the character, the very same brain regions are recruited both in adults and in six months old infants. This is a study by Daniel Hyde and collaborators using the same uh, methodology both with adults and, and infants, which is near infrared spectroscopy. And why is this interesting? Because for many years, this very region has been claimed based on explicit studies involving um, um, uh, adult uh, human subjects, involving fMRI techniques, techniques. It has been argued that this is the region which is specifically involved in such computation, in belief computations. Thus, based on this data, we have to, we have to um, argue that both infants and adults might involve or might recruit at least the same underlying uh, uh, brain mechanisms when they see these kind of scenarios. Of course, one might think that, oh, but maybe if they, uh, wh why, why should we believe that the, if they recruit the same brain areas, they involve the same kind of processes? Well, of course, there might be differences. Of course, we should not claim that uh, infant theory of mind reasoning and adult theory of, of mind reasoning is exactly identical. There might be many, many differences, and uh, we will talk about some. However, it could be that some basic processes are actually similar. How so um, before uh, going to the experimental part, I would like to mention one more thing, which is I would like to tell you why I'm interested in this kind of processes and what kind of phenomena I'm trying to explain. And for this, I will uh, present you briefly a very um, everyday, another everyday example, which is imagine you are on a skiing holiday and you are not this wonderful person who performs this maneuver, but you're one of the people here and uh, you are taking a, a rest from, uh, from, from skiing and you are at the bottom of this hill. And what you see that this skier actually performed this maneuver, however, 
this is an unsuccessful maneuver. So he or she falls and is approaching very fastly you and your group. However, there is an important thing here that you are facing this danger which is rapidly approaching. However, your friend Anne is facing you, so she cannot see that there is a danger. So what you will do in, a, in, the, in, a, in the time of a couple of seconds, you will actually compute that, oh, she, that she's not aware of the danger because she, does, she cannot see, so you prepare to warn her. However, if in this very moment Anne turns around and looks at the danger, then you will, you will compute that, oh, but now she looked at the danger, she's aware of it, she will pro perform the appropriate behavior, so you don't need to warn her. However, the story is not finished. If in this very moment Anne turns back to you and she continues discussing um, about the things which you were discussing without doing anything, you will realize that although she was looking in the direction of the danger, she for some reason failed to notice it. So she's not aware of the danger, you have to warn her and you will warn her. So why I'm telling you is because in the time of a couple of seconds, so it took me, I don't know how many, half a minute to explain you all this. However, all these computations are, are performed in one or two seconds. So these are very fast computations and why are they interesting for us and for the purpose of this talk? They are interesting because in the time of this um, a couple of seconds, you have computed what she sees, what she knows, what are the consequences for her behavior and what you should do, how you should modify your own behavior. And you not only computed it, but you recomputed it once, and moreover, you recomputed it also for the third time. That she's not aware, she's aware, she's not aware, and you modify your behavior accordingly. So my question, and um, the question which I tried to address, which I tried to investigate in the last 10, 10 years was, how we humans are able to perform such computations and what could be the processes which actually allow for the efficiency and the fastness of these computations. So um, in the last years, um, uh, actually there is an alternative view on theory of mind, while many years ago the standard view was that these, these computations are slow, they are effortful, they are late developing, and uh, they are used for explaining behavior or retrospective inferences. In the last year, what is argued that these, some of these processes are actually fast, they are effortless, spontaneous, and they have an early onset, they use for predictive purposes and for forward or online belief tracking. And uh, just, uh, so I will focus mostly on this alternative view, which is uh, this implicit theory of mind process which allow all these computations and recomputations. And although there has been lots of research in the last 10 years related not only to explicit theory of mind, but also to implicit theory of mind, and we are studying theory of mind since about 40 years. However, we still know very little about some basic things uh, in theory of mind. And one very basic thing is we have absolutely no idea when the belief is computed in a standard theory of mind task, whether it's explicit or implicit. So what I will now ask you to do is a small exercise. So I will show you a standard theory of mind task, which is exactly as the ones I, I explained. There will be a timer on the video, and I will be asking you to note the time when you compute the false belief of the character in the video and to tell me later what is this time when you computed this, uh, this belief. And now the video starts. The sound is not important, it's just music. So this is a standard false belief task. You have the two characters. There is a hiding event. So the main character puts her target objects into the box. And please remember to, to the timing, and when you compute her beliefs, you, you should uh, take a note, to, you should try to remember the timing. Then she leaves the scene, and as in the standard false belief task, of course, what happens is that uh, the other character replaces the object. And then the first character who has the false belief, she will come back. And that's it. So now I will ask you to, to tell me when you have computed her beliefs. So are there people who have computed the belief of the character at when she hid the objects? Yes, there are one, two, three, four, five, yes, like 10, 15, 20, okay. So some people compute it at this very first moment when, when the hiding happens. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, then are the people who have computed the belief or who think that they have computed the belief when uh, the replacing has happened, when the second character changed the location? 
Okay, well, I cannot count, of course, we are too many, but it seems that there are much more people who seem to believe that they have computed the belief at this time point. And finally, there is also a third time point. So are there people who computed or, or who thought about this, her belief when she came back to the scene? There are also quite some people. Okay, so seemingly there are the distribution, I don't know, it's 20%, the very first stage, 35 here, 35 here, or something like that. So seemingly, uh, we have different views and we have different intuition where we compute these beliefs. Of course, if you have difficulties in telling me when you have computed these beliefs, it's uh, not such a surprise because we don't have access to our mental processes and we probably uh, cannot really assess when these computations happen. However, uh, with experiments, what we can do, we can actually measure this and we can measure whether this computation happened early on uh, or whether they happen later. And why is this important? Of course, this is not important because we are interested in the time, but because we are interested in the time because the moment when you compute these beliefs involves different mechanisms. So let me just uh, try to explain what I mean. So it's not the same whether you compute the belief online at the moment of, uh, of hiding or at the moment of, uh, of replacing because this assumes that you track the event, you track the perspective of the other person, you track the reality, you track the relation between the two. So this, what I, this is what I call online tracking. However, these processes are radically different from the processes which happen at the, at the phase or at the time when the character returns. So when he comes back to the scene, then if you start to reason about um, the character's beliefs at this moment, then you have to use very different processes. You have to rely a lot on your memory. So the character comes back and you start wondering, oh, but what does she believe? Where, what she, will she do? Then you have to go back in time. You have to realize where she put her object, when, at the, when she left, what happened in the meantime, and you have to use this kind of retrospective uh, reasoning, which is um, heavily based on, uh, on memory processes. And actually, this could be very problematic for young infants because it requires a lot of, uh, of memory demands. Um, how can we know or how can we measure whether infants or adults use uh, one, processes, one kind of processes or the other kind of processes? We adults probably use both of them and probably infants can also use both of them. But now the question is, how can we actually um, realize which, is the more which are the most prevalent processes or which are the processes we use by default? And uh, we try to ask these questions in uh, different ways. So in some of the studies, what we try to do, we try to actually investigate whether young infants are able to use these retrospective processes to go back in time to reason what happened. And how did we do that? So this is a, um, a line of studies which we have done with Ildiko Kirai, Gergő Chibra and collaborators. And what we have done to just check whether actually young children can rely on retrospective theory of mind reasoning, we force them to do this retrospective reasoning. So how do we force them to do this retrospective reasoning? Well, we show them a, a, a standard false belief scenario, but we introduce an element which forces them to go back in time and, re re and um, revise their belief attribution. Let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So we show them a hiding event and a replacing event when the character is not present. So this would be a typical false belief scenario. However, before the character comes back, so before this stage, we actually show infants that this character, although he was not present, he could actually see what was happening through a one-way mirror, uh, which is in the room. So if in the beginning the child computed that this character has a false belief, now he has to revise that this character has actually a true belief because she could actually see the events through this one-way mirror. And uh, this is how we try to investigate whether they can do this kind of computation. And what we find that some of the computations are already uh, performed by very, very young infants, but you will hear more about this in uh, Yudiko Kirai's talk at um, uh, one of the symposiums during the conference. So in these studies, however, as I said, we force them to use this kind of retrospective reasoning because they have to revise something which has happened. They have, they co have computed something, now they have to go back in time and reinterpret it. And this is evidence that they can use these latter processes, the retrospective ones. But what is the evidence that they also use these online processes? And for that, um, it's unclear whether we have good evidence. And one way to study that would be to 
actually, and this is what I will uh, uh, present experimental data of, would be to actually use uh, um, electrophysiological markers at these various time events and just to check which are the moments in which a true belief scenario and a false belief scenario differs. And uh, this would allow us to draw conclusions that different processes take place at very specific time, time in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this kind of scenarios. So what we do in the very first study, which I will explain, is um, we try to tackle when exactly, whether they are all nine belief computation, and if they are so, when exactly this belief computation happen, and uh, what are their triggering cues, because of course these have to be triggered by something. Then, um, in a second study, this will be a study with, uh, with adults, an EEG study with adults. Then in a second study, which is again an EEG study, but with inference, we try to ask, so if um, there are these online computations, which are very fast and efficient, there must be some mechanism which support them. And uh, one way to think about it is that how, what are the most efficient mechanisms which an infant can rely on to compute another person's perspective? Well, it should be her own mechanism. So it's to compute someone else's perspective about something uh, would be most efficient if I use the same processes which I use when I compute my own perspective. And this is what we try to investigate, whether this is really the case that infants recycle uh, first-person processes when they do uh, third-person computations. And finally, we also ask a third question, and I will present some data on that, where we ask, so if there are these belief computations which are online, fast and efficient, what would be the format which would be most efficient? And of course, in adults, um, there is, uh, not much, no, it is not much question that these theory of mind computations are propositional, and they are flexible, and, uh, fa and could be fast because of this uh, propositional format. And the, but the question is whether um, we could find some evidence that even infants use this propositional format. And I will present a study where we try to find indirect evidence for that as well. But let me just speed up a little bit. So regarding the first question, when belief computation happen, whether they happen online, whether we can tackle on them, what can be the triggering cues. So this is an um, EEG study with adults where we have a modified uh, theory of mind task. However, there are three locations. However, the important thing uh, which uh, you have to remember, so there is a one um, uh, first event when there is an agent who sees the hiding of an object. This is a dog. Then she turns around and uh, the box uh, is closed. Then she turns around and uh, the reality starts to change. So the dog starts emerging from, from the location where he has been. So this is the moment when the agent has no visual access and the reality starts changing. And then there is also a second event which, uh, where belief computations uh, could take place, which is when the reality change has completed. So this dog started jumping out from this box and he actually jumped into the middle box and the agent has no visual access to, uh, to this. So what we try to do, we try to measure what kind, so we, uh, we relied on explicit theory of mind uh, task and um, findings, uh, um, ERP studies which have used explicit theory of mind task, which have identified uh, P300 and, uh, and the slow way, positive slow way component, uh, which was related to, which is related to theory of mind reasoning. And we targeted exactly this component and we wanted to see whether we find differences between um, uh, false beliefs situation and the true belief situation and the non-agent condition at any of these time points. So this would be online belief tracking. This is also online belief tracking. This is also online belief tracking when you gather evidence and you, uh, you track the events. Uh, we were not much interested in the very last phase because that's the offline or retrospective um, reasoning. So we were mostly interested in this trip. And um, let me show you what we find. So what we find that uh, we find uh, that a significant difference in this P300 and this uh, positive slow wave at this very moment when the agent has, um, um, ha has the, where the visual access of the agent is interrupted. So he has no more visual access to the scene and the very first change happens in the environment. So when the reality, so the first moment when the reality starts to change and he has no visual access. And this is the moment where specific belief computation uh, seem to take place. We do not find uh, this kind of, uh, this, is, this is the false belief condition and this is the true belief and the no agent condition um, down here. 
And we don't find this kind of differences in uh, the first phase or the, or, or the third phase. So from this, we conclude that seemingly some computation actually are triggered by exactly this, uh, um, uh, these events. And uh, next, what we, and moreover, what I forgot to tell you, that we, uh, we had three experiments, and in two of them, we used an implicit task where you were not told to track the, um, the beliefs of the character. And in the last experiment, we used an explicit task. So this is data from the implicit task. So even when your task is not related to tracking the belief of the agent, you do not have to pay attention to the agent. You, your task is actually to put this cat in one of the boxes which are empty where the dog is not, just to avoid that the dog hurts the, the cat. However, you nevertheless seem to track uh, the beliefs of the character to what she had visual access when the visual access was interrupted and these changes uh, happen. Okay, so next in the second experiment, we reason that actually this kind of, um, of trigger should be automatic and spontaneous and should be independent whether this belief will become true or false in the end. So what we did actually in the second experiment, we introduced, um, we first, uh, thank you, we first aimed to um, to replicate our findings. So we had the false belief condition and the true belief condition. However, we introduced another condition which we call true belief update condition. And this true belief update, so it's exactly the same. So she sees the hiding in this box, then she turns around and the reality starts to change. However, in the, in the, in the third phase, so this jog jumps out, but however, the jog jumps back into the very same location. So in the end, the uh, character's belief will become true. However, nevertheless, there was an event which she didn't see. And if these triggers are automatic and so on, we should find exactly the same signatures. And this is what we actually find. So now in two conditions, I'm not sure how well you see, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, in two conditions, we, saw, we find this increase, P, P300 and, uh, and, uh, and slow wave uh, in the true belief update and, um, and the false belief, and we do not find which is significantly different from the, from the standard true belief condition. So seemingly, these triggers, which is the interrupted visual access and the first change in the environment, um, are important and are triggered also in a true belief situation. So next, what we did in the third experiment, we wanted to see whether we find uh, the same signatures even in an explicit task. So now in this task, you are explicitly told, please track the beliefs of the character and make a decision in the very end, which takes into account her beliefs about the location of the dog. And what we observe is exactly the same. So this is the explicit condition. Here again, we have a, a false belief condition, this true belief update and the true belief condition. And we find exactly the same differences. We find this increased um, uh, amplitude for the false belief and the true belief update. Uh, which this suggests that actually whether this computation, this, there are the same computation which take place in explicit and implicit theory of mind. So what does this mean? So, here, from this study, we seem to have evidence that, uh, uh, the, this com that some computation happen uh, um, uh, online, and we also managed to identify some of these triggering cues, which is the interrupted access and the very first change in reality. And this means that actually we humans seem to track the other person's perspective and the interruption of this perspective and the reality, which is our own perspective, simultaneously. But not only that we track it simultaneously, but these two are interdependent. Because it's not that um, these, um, these, um, uh, um, these components are triggered not by one component or by the other. They are not triggered slowly by the change, uh, change in the environment, neither by the interruption of the, uh, of the perspective. They are triggered by the two together and in a specific combination, which means that we track them both, um, not, in, not only in parallel, but also interde in, interdependently. And these are uh, triggered automatically. It doesn't matter whether the belief will become false or true later. It doesn't matter whether the belief is um, it's explicit belief tracking or implicit belief tracking. Um, one note which I wanted to make here is that um, um, we did not find the difference between, uh, between the no agent condition and the true belief condition, which we don't really know how to interpret, what kind of processes are taking place there, what kind of tracking we do in true belief, but we can come back to that in the question period. Now, uh, um, I will try to move on to the second line of studies and the second set of questions, which was, so if we do these computations, they are efficient, fast, and online, 
So are these, do we rely on some processes? Do we recycle some processes from first person for these third person computations? And how did we do it? So this is, um, we relied on some finding, uh, this is a study with infants now, and again an EEG study. Um, so we, we rely on uh, some findings with Jordi, from Jordi Kaufman, and Gergely Chibra and collaborators, which have shown that if you show um, an object to an infant and then you occlude it, then there are specific uh, signatures which can be uh, observed or measured with the EEG, which are related to sustained object representation, which, sig which uh, signal that this object, although it's covered, the baby has no visual access to it, but she maintains actively this representation. Um, so what we did with um, uh, Dora Kampisch, my former PhD student, was the following. We introduced an agent and we replicated the, the, the same effect, that if the infant has access to, um, to an object which is then occluded, then we find this um, gamma um, uh, band oscillation and increase in gamma burst over the temporal electrode sites. However, this was not our crucial manipulation. Our crucial manipulation was the following. So what happens when uh, you, the baby, you have access to the object, however, this object is covered from the perspective of this agent. So if you track the perspective of this other agent that she has seen this object, now she doesn't see it, but she knows that the object is there, thus you maintain an object res representation on, on her behalf, <laughs> it is possible that we, similar processes are involved and we observe similar signatures for, for these sustained ob uh, object representations from the perspective on, of another agent. And this is actually what we find. We observe very similar um, um, signatures in the two cases. Um, so what should we conclude from this? Thank you. There are uh, uh, many, so seemingly uh, infants and adults probably will, will likely do the same, recycle some of our first person uh, processes, cognitive processes, and uh, we use them to perform third person computations. And also there's other evidence from um, Vicky Southgate's lab, which shows that uh, this is not only the case with uh, maintained object representations, but also when one makes motor predictions. So the same kind of alpha suppression can be observed when the baby reaches, when the baby observed reaches, or when the baby predicts reaching based on the false belief. So this uh, points to the same uh, idea. Of course, here there are also many questions which can be asked. So if the same system perform this computation, how can we differentiate between first person and uh, third person computations? So in the study with Dora, we have uh, some specific uh, late gamma bursts, which happens later in time, which we observe only in this condition, where uh, there is a uh, perspective taken from the agent and not from the, from the baby. And we, we try to argue that this might be like a kind of tagging later tagging that this is not my representation, but it's attributed to another person. However, all this is just a post hoc uh, explanation and we, know we need much more data on this. So, and finally, the very last bit, so the propositional format. So how can we ever investigate or how can we ever find out whether um, uh, babies use a propositional uh, representations for this theory of mind uh, reasoning? So we, it's not really a trivial question, but what we thought is the following. The logic is very simple, but the reasoning is a bit contorted. So the logic is, so if we find evidence that there is a content which the baby can integrate in a belief attribution, which can be only propositional, then we have to argue that belief reasoning in infants is propositional, or at least ha can deal with propositional content. So this is a logic, but how do we find the content which we, we are sure that is propositionally represented in infants? So, and for this, we apply to uh, a domain which is encoding absence. So encoding absence is not that trivial, it's not clear how we, so it's very easy to, and we have lots of studies uh, as, um, um, how we encode the presence of a, an object, but it's less clear how we encode the absence. Do we encode it at all? Do we use propositional reasoning? Do we say the object is not here? Do we say the object is somewhere else? And Esther Sabo, who has recently finished her PhD with me, she has dedicated several years to investigate this with very interesting finding from pre-verbal and non-verbal uh, creatures. However, 
Uh, what I would like to mention is um, a finding in the literature which shows that young babies do not seem to encode absence uh, in the specific situations. So this is a study by Win and Chang where you see an object which goes behind an occluder, then you see the object in one condition, which shouldn't be surprising, of course, because you have seen the object going here, now you see it. However, in the other condition, what you see, you see the object going from here away. However, in the outcome, you see this object. And of course, if you have encoded the absence of this object here, you should be surprised as a baby. However, uh, it seems that you are not. And this is, there are also other studies which uh, show the same kind of null result that seemingly babies do not seem to encode absence and it's not that trivial how absence is encoded. So why is this interesting for us? It is interesting because um, we were wondering, so how do we represent absence? Uh, when the car exits, it could be at least two ways. Of course, there can be many more, but let's say there are two ways. One is the easy way through the object file system. So you take this, um, you assign a pointer to this object, and then you move this pointer uh, to, the, to the side. In this case, you move, sorry, sorry. Uh, so in this case, you move um, the pointer to the curtain and, we, and then the pointer might fade out or the attention index might be lost. However, there's also, there might be a propositional way which is the hard way and you encode there is no car behind the occluder. Okay, but there are very specific cases of, uh, of, uh, of absence and this is one specific case. I'm not sure whether you have noticed this, but I play it again. So this is the, the, the case of uh, when the object disintegrates, it disappears, it vanishes. So in this case, why is this interesting for us? Because if you assign the pointer, now what happens, you actually delete the pointer. So you deleted the pointer, you have nothing here. So if you encoded this propositionally, propositionally then you still have the, the, the representation, there is no card there. And why is this interesting? Because if we use now an attribution situation where we have a, an agent who watches this object disappearing, so if he watches this car disappearing, if you use the object file system and you delete this pointer, there's nothing you can attribute to this, uh, to this agent because there's nothing in your representational system. You had an index, now you deleted it, you have nothing. So there's no attribution you can make. However, you can make an attribution when, uh, when, if you encode this propositionally. So this is the logic. If you find evidence that in such a situation, infants encode this, then we must reason that this is propositional. And I think I have one minute, right? Yes, so uh, this is what we have done. So this is a situation where we have an agent who sees a ball disappearing, then he leaves the scene, and in his absence, a ball comes in, and in the end, you find the ball. We have a true belief condition where the agent sees the ball going out, the ball coming back, and there is the ball. In the true belief condition, there should be no surprise to find a ball because um, he has seen a ball there. However, in the false belief condition, you, the baby could be surprised on the behalf of the Smurf because the Smurf has seen the ball uh, disintegrating and doesn't know that another ball came back. So the reasoning is that if you had made this attribution that he believes there's no ball, then you might be surprised in the false belief condition compared to this condition. Of course, as you see well, so if you concentrate on these two, if you just go by your own first person representations, in both cases what you see that the ball comes back and the ball is revealed. So you should not be surprised uh, based on first person representation. And uh, what we find that indeed babies, these are 12 months old, seem to show evidence that these representations, uh, you have encoded these representations and you have attributed to them. And this is not the case. So we have several controls for this study. Uh, one of them is this non-agent control. And um, we want to see whether you encode this disappearing uh, ball propositionally in first person. And if yes, then you should show the same evidence here from first person when you see this, see this disappearance. You should be surprised by the presence of the ball when no agent is present. However, you are not. And I think I'm uh, out of time, so I will just very briefly uh, say two things about this. So in these studies, we seem to have found out something about uh, online belief tracking, what could be the triggering cues, how this might happen, what processes might support it, and what kind of representations might rely on. And um, of course, there are lots of open questions, but I will leave that to the question period, and I would like to finish with thank you. Thank you for Gagne and Julie, of course, for all the inspiration across these 10 years. Thank you for the collaborators to this study. 
And of course, thank you to the CDC members 2010 and 2020. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Can you say a little bit more about how you think the beliefs are tagged as my own versus other people's? I know you said that you have kind of more speculative ideas about this, but I just wonder if you can share more. Right, so, um, so in this um, EEG study, so we, you mean what are the, the mechanisms and what are the processes which, uh, which, uh, by which we do this tagging? So we actually, so the only evidence we have in this, uh, in this EEG study that when you have perspective tracking or object maintenance from, from the first person view and object maintenance from the other person's view, then there seem to be a difference when, uh, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is signaled by an increased gamma burst at the later time point at around 600 milliseconds, which could be related to some kind of tagging or some kind of specification. This is all speculative. So what we just see is a difference between the two conditions at the later time point which could mean many things, but one thing which it could mean is that somehow the two are, so this is just one signature which says that the two are somehow different. Of course, it doesn't tell us uh, how they are different in cognitive terms. So, but maybe the, the other EEG study with adults, maybe that other EEG study tells something about this issue as well. So probably the tagging uh, likely happens when the agent is turned around and the reality changes. So when there is this interruption of, uh, uh, of, um, of, uh, of perspective of what he, what he believes, and there is a change in an environment because this is the moment when you have to, when you, so you track the beliefs and mine is similar to yours and you, you probably do this, we don't know how. Um, but then at a certain moment, there is interrupted visual access, there is a change in the environment, and this is the moment where you have to think, oops, but she has not seen this, so she does not believe what I, so this is the moment when the, when the two beliefs kind of uh, are, go, go part away. But we have, we, we have no idea how this happens, and we, we do not yet have good methods to tackle on this, but we are trying to, sorry. Um, thanks very much. I've, I've got a question regarding the, uh, the reaction time differences in the last study. It's, it's perhaps a very naive question, but sort of how, how do you interpret these reaction time differences in terms of speeding up in one condition versus slowing down in the other condition? Because the way you described it was by surprise in the false belief condition. So they're surprised and that's why they're slower in the false belief condition. And an alternative would be um, it's, it's a case of speeding up in the case of uh, expectation consistent events. So the upper bar would be speeded up. And so you could, is it, would that be an alternative option to say in the upper case you've got expectation consistent events in two ways because it's consistent with your expectation and the expectation of the smurf. So there's double speeding up. Uh, whereas in the lower case, uh, that's not the case. So it's not, it's not that it, there's the surprise is the crucial issue in the, in the lower bar, but the double expectation consistency is the case in the upper bar. But, but th the basic question is, what does that mean? Is it, is it a case of speeding up or interference and uh, slowing down? Uh, that's a very good question. So these are, well, not reaction times, but looking times. Yeah. And in looking times, we don't know what speeding up means. So, so uh, um, of course, yeah, I, I see your point, and uh, uh, what I would like to mention that even uh, whether it's speeding up or whether it's surprisal, and that's why there is a, a longer looking, both of them would mean that there the belief computation has happened. Both of me them would mean the same. I think here, so there's not much evidence, uh, or I don't know of very many studies which would suggest that uh, if uh, there is, yeah, speeding, what do you mean by speeding up? I'm not sure what, what uh, speeding up would mean. Uh, it would be something that you have a representation 
and you have a representation which is consistent in this, and uh, speeding up means that uh, the processing time to process this last representation uh, takes less. <coughs> Something like this, what you mean. Yes, yes, this is, uh, this is possible. Uh, it, this explanation is not much used in the violation of expectation studies, but yes, it, uh, it's a possible explanation, although, yeah, it, it would, the conclusion would be the same, but yes, that's an interesting point. I have a question regarding the ADAT uh, EEG uh, mm -hmm. study, where uh, beliefs were computed even when they remained uh, 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 true. And I was wondering if at any later stage, uh, if you found any difference between true and false beliefs. So when the dog went back, as opposed to the one dog went to the other box, uh, is there a difference between true and false? So, um, so between um, true and false, you mean at the, um, sorry. You mean whether we find any difference at this, uh, at this stage when? Uh, Not at this stage because this is unbeknown unbeknownst to the uh, 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 observer or the uh, uh, party, but when, either when she turns back or when the state of the dog is uh, uh, changed, uh, so the ensuing stages. So, yeah, so in comparison, so this would be like a true belief. When she has a true belief, she's watching the events, do we find a, a signature which would resemble that when there is any kind of movement? No, we don't. So that's, that's it, that is the control condition. So what we, what we compare, sorry, is exactly this. So here, the, the, the reality starts to change in all conditions, meaning that the dogs start to emerge. Here, the reality change has happened. The dog jumped out, jumped into other box. And I in this phase, we don't find any difference between conditions, nor an increased um, amplitude in true belief, if this was your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, not really being in this literature, uh, what role the systems that underlie uh, consciousness and metacognition can distinguish between implicit and explicit theory of mind and potentially the development or the transition from an implicit to an explicit theory of mind. Um, now that we're at the point in the literature where we can start looking at brain networks, it seems like there might be things from the adult literature <coughs> about the role of consciousness, about the role of awareness of your own thoughts that might be spearheading the transition? Yeah, so um, since many years, um, historically, consciousness and metacognition uh, and counterfactual reasoning are linked. And uh, here we have Joseph who has worked on a lot on that. And uh, um, yes, so uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of recent studies which uh, try to, to link uh, uh, implicit theory of mind, uh, metacognition, and consciousness, and uh, try to, uh, to study all these together. Uh, but um, yeah, that's a very interesting question, uh, how these develop and uh, whether uh, they rely on each other or there is a, um, there are some processes which are common. Of course, there are also distinct processes, but some processes might be uh, uh, common. Um, recently, there's also lots of, lots of, lots of claims about um, some kind of implicit consciousness or of kind of consciousness which can be measured in infants and uh, animals as well or non-speaking non entities. I'm not sure whether you thought of this kind of literature, but... Um, yeah, I'm not aware of uh, integrative uh, statements or findings. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to stop here. <laughs>